Well, good morning. It is clear that uh, we have entered that period of the year when folks are traveling. And uh, I uh, was on a flight that getting back into town just a couple of nights ago, um, they found an equipment problem. They were going to fix it. They couldn't fix it. Oh, yeah, we can fix it. No, they didn't fix it. We had to go all the way to a different terminal, get on a different plane. And uh, you, you know how that goes. And uh, it just makes you realize what a miracle air travel is and what a hassle air travel is. But it's, uh, it's so, so sweet to be home. And uh, I was at the meetings, among other things, of the uh, Evangelical Theological Society. And it was great to see so many of our folks there, including so many graduates who are all over the world. And um, anyway, the better place to be is home. And I am thrilled to be here with you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful, not just because this is a season of thankfulness, but because for each of us as your creature, every single moment is a season of thankfulness. Father, you brought us into being, you gave us life, you loved us despite our sin and saved us through the blood of the Lamb. Out of the silence you spoke, and we have your word as gift. Father, we pray to be a good steward of that gift this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm taking a quick scan around the room for reasons that will become a little more obvious as we go on. As we begin Numbers chapter 25, we find ourselves in one of the most crucial texts in Scripture, and one that is most challenging to discuss. But the very fact that it's challenging becomes a mandate that we discuss it. Numbers chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked itself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill these of his men who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them. The man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. This is one of those texts that is meant to summon revulsion. It is meant to appear as a scene of abject horror. And it is a multiple horror because it is the horror of idolatry demonstrated in the horror of adultery. In order to understand this, and it's a persistent theme, of course, through Scripture, as we shall see all the way well into the New Testament, the theme of adultery or faithlessness is meant to summon a moral revulsion that we are to transfer from the one thing to the other. And so this is a metaphor, if you put it in a sentence. It is an analogy simply by its very existence. This is like that. If you understand this, then you understand that. The this in this case is adultery, and the that is idolatry. Now, you could logically order it backwards. You could say the, the this is idolatry and the, the that is adultery. 
But the meaning of a metaphor is to take that which is most familiar and transfer what we know from that familiar thing to another thing that is less familiar. That's why you use a metaphor. This is, if you understand this, understand it's like that. The logic of scripture is that if you want to understand idolatry, then ponder adultery. Because this is like that. It is persistent in scripture. It's the theme that comes again and again and again. In the Old Testament, just think of the prophet Hosea and his adulterous wife, Gomer. Just, just consider the recurring theme in which it is said that idolatry is, is, is like a going, a whoring after foreign gods, after foreign idols. It is, it is, it is a metaphor that eventually needs no explanation because it is so familiar in the biblical texture and text. Here in chapter 25 of Numbers, we come to understand that while Israel was at Shittim, there is, it's close to the Jordan. When they got there close to the land of promise, now they're not, they're not crossing the Jordan, but they get closer to the land of promise, what do they do? They began to whore with the daughters of Moab. And the word whore here, of course, is a verb. And so this is what they did. They were whoring after the daughters of Moab. And this is not merely what some people might consider after a battle, as we have seen, uh, a victory of Israel over its enemies. Remember, we were looking at the oracle of Balaam, you know, et cetera, in the, in the passage before, indeed the chapters before. In, in chapter 25, after that, after that, the men of Israel began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Now, that could be common, as in the marching armies of Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or any of these ancient, ancient armies that was, it was considered that a part of the rights of conquest was the rights of sex. And, uh, and, and this is a perpetual problem of war. Uh, this was something that required enormous discipline on the part of the American military forces conquering uh, territory in the final campaigns of World War II, where the American high command simply made clear that such activity would be subject to the most extreme of sentences, and that included the sentence of being shot by a firing squad. That put a significant damper upon American troops in terms of acting in this way. The Soviet troops, on the other hand, were set loose by Stalin on the, the women of, East, of the East, and, and particularly in places like Berlin, uh, leading to, and, and as a matter of fact, an enormous number of Russian-German children being born within a year of the Russian victory. It's a, it, it's a part of the conquest theme. And the conquest is exactly what is coming when Israel enters the land of promise. It's, it's surviving right now, but it is surviving by battle. And having won the battle, there would be a certain military code in the ancient Near East that says that you can now take sexual rights away from the women of the conquered. Now, obviously, this is something Israel must not do, but Israel does it. And at this point in the text, you're supposed to feel absolutely horrified and shocked. These are the men, and, and especially as they would have been the warriors, the young men of Israel. And, 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 and they are going whoring after these women of the peoples they have conquered. And, and so the horror of adultery is held up here. We're to see it, it is to be shocking. And, and it, it would be like discovering that, that the people who knew they shouldn't do this were doing this. That once they won this battle, which by the way was given to them at the hand of the Lord, they are then denying the Lord and disobeying the Lord by this horrifying display of adultery. So that is supposed to shock you. But the thing to know is it's supposed to shock you on the way to shocking you about something else. That's the point. It is to shock you about that in order to shock you about something else. And, and, and the something else is idolatry. But in this case, it's not simply a metaphor. And, and that's, that's what makes this text so powerful. And it makes the theme that works its way through scripture so powerful. It's not, it's not just a metaphor. Because what we are looking at here is the fact that the, the conquered people were followers of the Baal of Peor. So we're talking about the Baal. And uh, I, I, I think... Like you, I grew up where it was given a 
particularly strange southern pronunciation, bail. It's like if it's two A's, you just hunker down on the A, bail. It's a diphthong, so it's Baal. But nonetheless, this horrifying idol. Uh, the, the reason it's called the Baal of Peor is because of the location. And so it's a, it, it, it's, it's, it's a local version of a regional god, a regional idol. Now, I know some of you heard me tell this before, but it's just so clear. I'm gonna, going to mention it again. In about 1976, the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention decided that it would publish an encyclopedic dictionary of the Bible. Sounds like a good thing to do, right? Baker Bookhouse had one. Uh, Thomas Nelson had one. The Lifeway, or what was then the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, which had, by the way, an enormous repository of articles been publishing uh, for years and years, a journal on biblical archaeology. They said, let's... Uh, Let's put out this pictorial dictionary. It became a huge hit in an unintended audience. It was put in church libraries, and like middle school boys found it absolutely fascinating. Someone decided they ought to find out why this was so attractive to middle school boys, and they found out it was a complete sex education in a Bible, illustrated Bible dictionary. Uh, and, and not only that, it was openly pornographic. Uh, because the idols were openly pornographic. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that if you are an idolater, so just use your imagination for a moment, and I hesitate to tell you it's closer than you want to admit, but just, just imagine for a moment, imagine that you were going to idolize a, a human form, or you're going, to, you're going to seek to represent an idol with a human form, and and the idol is going to be directed at what you are looking for from this God. In other words, the God is the source of something. The God, this God is the source of something. Well, we, we, we have to be careful about this, but we cannot be reticent to speak the truth about this because the truth is supposed to be what we're confronting here in all of its horror. So you would take the sexual capacity of a human being and you would amplify it in your idol. You'd amplify it. So the male would become a god form of extreme male potency. You do the math. The female god would be a god of extreme uh, fertility, and the ability to nurse young, you do the math. And it wasn't just the size of the analogical human parts, it is even the number of them on the female, which in some of the idols, there would be, it would be more than a middle schooler should count. It, it's just there in all of its horror. You just look at the picture and you know immediately what this God represents. You do, you, you do not have to have a PhD in Near Eastern archaeology to know exactly what this idol represents. Baal was not only associated with fertility, thus certain representations, he was also associated with what was also necessary for life, and that is rain. And, and, and so you, you have uh, the... the the ability to bring rain represented in what they analogically sometimes suggested was his voice in the thunder. So you would, you would hope that by performing sacrifices to this idol, giving obeisance to this idol, taking care of this idol, worshiping this idol, you might have fertile crops, you might have many lambs and many calves and you might have thunder and thus have rain and have crops similarly to the female which was the lesser of the two in most of these tribes but not always not always the case then it was its fertility of course and fecundity uh, but it's also a horrifying misuse of sexuality and the power of women in sexuality. 
In this case, it is the Baal of Peor. It is not only adultery that points to idolatry, it is adultery in service of idolatry. This is something else we find in Scripture. We find it more than one place in the Old Testament where Israel is doing things that ought not to do under green trees, evergreen trees. Evergreen trees were a sign of life, and so often cultic prostitution took place under these green canopies. And when it says Israel did what it not, ought not to do under the green trees, that's what it's talking about. Here we have cultic prostitution these, that is the prostitutes of Moab, invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So the sacred prostitution ended usually in its festivals in an orgiastic feast. You do the math. And so there would be eating, there would be a festival meal in supposed honor of this idol, and then Afterwards, acts would be performed in the view often of the idol in order to hint, hint, hint about fertility. So in verse 25, excuse me, of chapter 25, verse 2, these people invited the people, that is the, the, the men of Israel, to the sacrifices of their gods. And so that's what's really crucial. In other words, it starts out with idolatry. So that, that tells us that it's not disguised in any way and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Well, just remember how often already the anger of the Lord's been kindled against Israel. And, and Israel's been tempted by idolatry and given into it. It has insulted the Lord and given into it. It has been unfaithful to the Lord and given into that unfaithfulness. And in so many cases, that it is a plague that the, the Lord delivers, and, uh, and once that plague takes place, it is ended only by some extreme action of correction. But before we get to that, Moses understands what he's dealing with here. And, and this is where we have to understand that this is something that is a faster action. It, 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 it is in, indicated here to be a shockingly fast action. In other words, this thing is so absolutely horrifying, it has to be stopped right now, and everyone involved in it has to be put to death right now. There's a right now about this that you are to feel in this text, just given the compression of the words and the seriousness of what is being discussed here. Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And then again, the instruction in verse 5, And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. So just imagine you've got the, the chieftains here, and they have now been ordered by Moses quickly, expeditiously, without hesitation, to kill all of the men who were involved in this cultic prostitution, this whoring after the Baal of Peor, and their bodies are to be hung in public so that they can be seen in the sun as a warning to all the people about the cost of idolatry entered into through adultery. And so you ask the question, how, how worse can anything get than this? How, 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 how much worse could anything be than this? It's, a, it's such a horrifying picture that it's supposed to be absolutely shocking. We are to look at this and, and, and recoil in horror because of what is represented here. And you say, what could be worse than this? Well, just wait. Just wait. That's what happens in verse 6 and following. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. So now you have a man of Israel who dares to take one of these adulterous Midianite women and bring her into the assembly of Israel 
and even into what is described as the chamber. In other words, he is intending to bring cultic prostitution into the tabernacle of God. So when you think things can't get worse, they get worse in a hurry. And the, the thing is, this is all within the sight of Israel. So Israel is seeing this. What will happen? Who will do something to, to end this horror? His name is Phineas, as you see in verse 7. When Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw as so he's a priest, the grandson of Aaron, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Okay, we dare not be more graphic than Scripture, but we dare not be less clear than Scripture. They are evidently in an act of sexual union where with one thrust of the spear, Phineas kills him and her so that blood rushes out of her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Well, we know the sin has consequences. We know that idolatry has consequences. And, but, but are we actually capable, honestly, of imagining what it would be like to have the precincts of the Lord violated in this way? A, a, a man bringing a Midianite cultic prostitute into the assembly of Israel and even into the chamber after, after there had already been the order of the public execution of the many of Israel who had gone a-whoring after foreign gods and involved themselves in cultic prostitution. When we look at a text like this, honestly, it, 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 it begs a question. It it doesn't ask it directly, but it prompts us to ask it. Why did the Lord choose these people? I mean, couldn't he have done better than this? Just consider all the rebellion that's already taken place. Consider all the, all the revolt that's already taken place. All the ingratitude that's already been dem demonstrated. Couldn't he find anybody better than this? I mean, he chose Israel of all the peoples of the earth, and this, this is the best? Well, you know, that is not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say Israel was the best nation and thus God chose it. God chose it because it was an insignificant thing to show the power of his might. And, and you know, it's, it's important that we transfer this. You think the church is made up of people who deserve to be saved? No, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is made up of people who otherwise would be just like this. But by the grace and mercy of God, transformed by the grace of God, there but by the grace of God go we. I want to go a little deeper into this. In Isaiah chapter 57, so we've got to go considerably into the text. It's about Israel's idolatry. The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. But you draw near, sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman. Whom are you mocking? Against whom do you open your mouth wide and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of transgression, the offspring of deceit, who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree? You slaughter, who slaughter your children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. 
They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering. You have brought a grain offering. Shall I re relent for these things? On a high and lofty mountain you have set your bed. And there you went up to offer sacrifice. Behind the door and the doorpost you have set up your memorial for deserting me. You have uncovered your bed. You have gone up to it. You have made it wide. You have made a covenant for yourselves with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. You journeyed to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far off and sent down even to Sheol. You were wearied with the length of the day, with the length of your way, but you did not say it is hopeless. You found new life for your strength. So you were not faint. The reference in verse 5 to under every green tree is, is the same thing. But did you notice something? And, and this is something we have to follow. The, the theme of adultery in the Old Testament as linked to idolatry works both ways. Which is to say, in this case, you have the men of Israel fulfilling physically a male role in a whoring after foreign gods and in cultic prostitution. But it works the other way too because Israel is often presented not just as an adulterer but as an adulteress. She has laid down with foreign gods. And, and it is this theme of spiritual adultery, of course, that is the theme of the book of Hosea. The, the prophet Hosea is depicting God as the wounded one and his people as having, in a female way, committed adultery. And of course, this is picked up in New Testament theology and the theme of the bride and the bridegroom, where in positive fulfillment, the marriage supper of the lamb is presented in its purity and in its wonder. This is such an important theme in biblical theology. It's so important in our understanding of the gospel and in our unpacking of scripture faithfully. I decided to do this morning what I normally wouldn't, wouldn't do simply because I, I don't want to turn this into an academic lecture, but there's some things here that, that are more than we can discuss in this context. And in uh, the process of evangelicals rediscovering biblical theology, something that's taken place very fruitfully in the last half century or so. There's, there's some important works, and I, I just bring two to mention to you. One of them is a book in the series, New Studies in Biblical Theology. It's by Ray Ortland, um, and it's entitled God's Unfaithful Wife, this, A Biblical Theology of Spiritual Adultery. So this gets right down to biblical theology and understanding the horror of idolatry as a symbol for Israel's sin. For instance, speaking in this sense of an earlier passage in Numbers, Ray Ortland Jr. says, quote, Yahweh's jealousy for his wife Israel requires that she offer her devotion to no other lover, just as a man will share his wife with no other. The covenant creates a sacred boundary not to be encroached upon. It warrants a lawful sense of entitlement within God, which when violated, generates intense emotional upheaval. Deuteronomy 32, 16, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods with abominable practices. They provoked him to anger. Deuteronomy 32, 21, they have stirred me to jealousy with what is no God. They have provoked me with their idols. Psalm 78, 58, for they provoked him to anger with their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their graven images. One of the things that's helpful here is that Ray takes us through passages that turn out not only to be similar, but parallel. When we saw in Numbers 15 a similar kind of pattern... It is reminded to us that Israel was told in Numbers 15 
to put a tassel on the robe. Remember, they were to, we, we covered this and we mentioned it. They put a tassel on the robe to remind themselves that they belonged to Yahweh. It's chapter 15. This is chapter 25. So don't miss the fact that the tassel did not stop them from committing adultery. The tassel was there on the robe as a witness against them from Numbers chapter 15. It did not stop them in their ardor for adultery and idolatry. The other book I wanted to mention is by another friend. Uh, this is uh, G.K. Beale. The title of his book is We Become What We Worship, A Biblical Theology of Idolatry. I found both of these very helpful over the years. Uh, Beale's book, the logic is made very clear in the title of the book, We Become What We Worship. And he's got golden bulls from the ancient Near East on the front of the book. About Numbers chapter 25, where we are, listen to this. In Numbers 25, 1, the verb to commit immorality or to play the harlot may carry both a literal and a metaphorical sense, the latter referring to spiritual fornication with Baal. This is likely from observing Numbers 25, 3, where the immoral portrayal of Israel joining themselves to the Baal of Peor continues the narrative description of Israel's idol worship from verses 1 through 2. Immorality with the women was part of the idolatrous worship. At the least, even if commit immorality in Numbers 25, 1 refers strictly to physical sexual licentiousness, Israel is still seen as committing spiritual immorality in verse 3 through the reference to joined. Again, maybe we, we didn't hear that. The, the, the reference to joined. And so even as in sexual intercourse, there is a joining. It is a horrifying picture of idolatry, which is a joining. Israel's joined itself to an idol. Israel was performing sexual rituals as a fertility rite, which they believed was an imitation of all sexual acts with his consort, from which they hoped to benefit with various material blessings of fertility. Now listen to this. Revelation chapter 2 verse 14 also makes clear allusion to the same Numbers 25 passage and uses the same verb to commit immorality with the double sense of literal and spiritual fornication with an emphasis on the latter. There's also a reference to the very same Numbers episode. That's this episode, Numbers 25 and Hosea 9.10 there we saw that Israel became detestable as the Baal idol which they had loved. The fact that Paul refers to Numbers 25 reference and employs the same verb to commit immorality suggests that he also has a double reference in mind. But even if not, the use shows a reference to immorality inextricably linked to idolatry, which we first found in 1 Corinthians 6. Well, again, we're going to turn to that. Paul's conclusion 1 Corinthians 6, 16, or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. So indeed, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And you see the larger context. Verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God, and by that, that shows the right order. Notice the intrusion of any kind of idol in there is unthinkable. Verse 14, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her, for it is written the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. 
Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I think it's very tempting for us to think that this is Old Testament stuff. Numbers 25 is Old Testament stuff. It's, it's ancient Near Eastern stuff. It's Canaanite idolatry stuff. It's adultery in the Old Testament stuff. It's hang them in the sun where they may be seen by the people stuff. It's spear through the man and the woman in the chamber killing both stuff. But as much as it is tempting to see this as just Old Testament stuff, Paul brings it right into 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 and chapter 10, making very clear that sexual immorality is more than sexual immorality. It is more, it is more than, it's not less than, but it is even more than joining with another body. It is an act of defiance against the Lord who saved us. If anything, it's the horror of Numbers 25 made more horrible. For now we sin against Christ and against his sacrifice for us. Well, going back to Numbers 25. Phineas. Phineas is the grandson of Aaron. And even though Aaron's family has been at times seemingly... Unsure of what to do, sometimes doing exactly the wrong thing. In this case, Phineas does exactly the right thing. Phineas takes a spear and thrusts it through this couple involved in such acts. And thus they become a public display. There's something else here. Verse 7, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. I don't know if you noticed here, but in, in, in most of the other parallel passages, God, God has told Moses what to do to bring about the end of the plague. God has made this. And this is a bit different. This is a bit different. The, the question is what's going to happen. And, and there isn't time in this sequence. There isn't time for someone to ask the Lord, what do you do? Someone's got to know what to do. Someone, some, someone has to spring into action. That's the glory of Phineas. Phineas doesn't have to have a word from the Lord to know what to do. Phineas doesn't have to have a command from Moses to know what to do. Phineas has a responsibility and he just leaps into action and with the spear thrust through these two, you'll notice though it says, it's, it's grotesque, it's meant to be The man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Notice verses 10 and following. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. The name of the slain man of Israel who was killed with a Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zur, who was the tribal head of a father's house in Midian. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, harass the Midianites and strike them down for they have harassed you with their wiles with which they beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the chief of Midian, their sister who was killed on the day of the plague on account of Peor. 
So Phineas here is honored so much that he's honored with a perpetual priesthood. Phineas is honored because he knew what to do to turn back the, the Lord's wrath from the people of Israel. He was jealousy for God's jealousy. And it's a beautiful passage. Phineas was jealous for God's jealousy. And that's what we are to be. We're to be jealous for God's jealousy. Uh, we are to seek to be as offended by idolatry and by unfaithfulness as God himself is. We are to seek to conjure in ourselves to work towards the proper jealousy after God's jealousy. When you get to verse 13, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, and listen to this, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. That is one of the early explicit references to substitution. It's an explicit reference to the death of someone as a substitute for someone else. And, and that focuses back on the spear and the end of the spear where there is a man of Israel and a Midianite daughter. Phineas's act bringing about their death Effected an atonement of substitution. That's what's in this text. He killed them for their sin, and thus the anger of the Lord was satisfied. But already by then, something like 25,000, 24,000, according to the text, had died. So an, an act of substitution appears so early, and of course this is pointing to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the cross, one of the indignities applied to Christ was a spear in his side. It is amazing to me how a passage like Numbers 25 can ricochet throughout Scripture. It shows up in the Psalms where Phineas is honored. It, it, it shows up, as we've seen, uh, in the prophetic literature. It uh, shows up in the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. It, it, it shows up in its own way, even at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an absolutely astounding passage. It's a, it's a horrifying passage. When someone says, well, what'd you talk about in the Bible study this morning? Cultic prostitution, adultery, a man and a woman in adultery in the chamber killed by a spear thrust by Phineas, the Lord's jealousy kindled, the Lord's jealousy satisfied. Satisfied because Phineas did what Phineas knew he had to do on behalf of the people of Israel, jealous with the very jealousy of God. Well, I determined that there was nowhere to go this morning after this passage. We just need to let this sit. And so we'll, we'll let it sit. I, I have to tell you that even in preparation for this, I, I was struck by something I don't think I had adequately seen in this passage. Honestly, I, I think I had known the horror of the passage, and that's what grabs us by the neck, by the throat. But it was that phrase that Phineas was jealous with my jealousy among them that struck me. Um, may we pray that we'll be jealous in the right way for the jealousy of God. In this case, not for the children of Israel as his prized possession, but his church. It certainly points to something like preaching and worship where we're headed. It certainly points to the means of grace. It certainly points to discipline. Now, church discipline is perhaps summarized here as seeking as a church to be jealous for the jealousy of God, not allowing within ourselves among ourselves, such things to go without redress. The 
come to a passage like Deuteronomy, as we see the idolatry there, you go to a passage even in the Exodus and you see the idolatry there. You come to Numbers 25 and you see the idolatry here and you wonder why in the world does God put up with this people? And then you look through the history of the Christian church and if honest, you have to ask the same question. It certainly is not to our glory, but his. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for all you've given us in this text. May it reside in our hearts. May it resound in our hearts. May it be used in our hearts by the Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.